Thank you very much uh, to all to be here. Uh, sorry for my English. So I, I keep mixing German and English. So if I pronounce it well, something like very German, you can say Darío. We didn't understand. Um, so yeah, we are very happy to be here. I hope you are also very happy to be here. Um, I want to, um, of course, I want to thank you and also thank the panelists here. As he said, Ines, Katia, to be here, also Mariano, that is with the matter. Uh, and also the organizer, Gustavo and Boris, to give the opportunity to talk about these important subjects and also to create this, this space for debate. Um, so I'm going to explain the methodology that we are going to, to use. Um, the idea is that we have until 4 o'clock to debate and to share ideas. At the beginning, my introduction will be five minutes, or oh, it was to be five minutes. Um, and after that, I'm going to, to give the floor to the panelists, and they are going to talk for 10 minutes, maybe a little bit more, it's not so exact. Um, and after that, after half an hour, we are going to open the floor for you in order to have comments and ask and questions to the panelists. But I would ask that these uh, questions and these commenters should be very precise and not so open. And please don't take like 10 minutes to, uh, to explain your point. It's very important. Um, after that, it's going to be like the second round of intervention in order to take into account what were your commentars and your questions. Uh, and then we are going to repeat this form until the end. So we are going to have three the intervention, the interventions with uh, half an hour and uh, yeah, two times your intervention. So uh, if something that you uh, will ask, uh, want to ask, just uh, wait until your, your time. Uh, and also I want to uh, present the, the axis. This panel is um, the, the idea of this panel is to think about democracy and how to bring new ideas and even if the word democracy works for us and how to deal with this idea. So the first, the first axis would be this dichotomy between, um, between dictatorship or authoritarianism and democracy, if this dichotomy works for us. And also the second point will be how from this critique how to create or how to we can learn from praxis and for experiences of struggle that present another forms of um, political organization. And then what the third axis would be what type of organization we want to create and at the end, what should we do with the state and how to handle the state. Yeah, we are taking the state. No, sorry, we are not taking the state. Uh, no, sorry, 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 Scholz, that's one of my fault, sorry. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I want to present Ines Durán. She is a researcher from the Benemérita, Benemérita Universidad de Puebla, and also she is connected with working struggles and counter strategies of the indigenous people. So she's also an activist. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Dario, and thank you everybody to be here. Um, I'm really, really, really happy because um, I'm getting to to know each other like like, I don't know, for the first time. Uh, so I'm really excited, so excuse me for that, uh, if I'm a little bit nervous also. But well, um, okay, so, so when we were thinking about this, um, this panel, we were thinking about um, a lot uh, how to, to discuss this. And, and, and for me, it goes to my experience accompanying uh, indigenous peoples in Mexico. Um, especially, um, uh, my experiences have been informed uh, since 2017 when I began to support uh, the Congreso Nacional Indígena and the Ejército Zapatista de Liberación Nacional proposal of establishing the Consejo Indígena de Gobierno. In this sense, uh, I want to make a clear statement that I. Um, what I'm going to share uh, does not necessarily reflect uh, the Zapatistas and the CNI's ideas and opinions, 
They are my thoughts born from accompanying these, uh, these struggles. Um, there are also reflections in progress, so I might not give you any answers, but raise a lot of questions. For me, what is important is to, to dialogue with Katia, with Assise, and with you all. So after saying that, I want to, to start first by talking a little bit about uh, how I began to wonder about democracy. So many of you might remember that on January 1st, 1994, the Zapatistas raised a series of demands to the Mexican government in which democracy was one of them. But after 28 years, I wonder if their claims have changed. Um, how are they envisioning alternative futures and engaging to create them globally? So Zapatistas indeed have placed at the center of discussions around democracy, and many, many scholars have identified their struggle as a form of radical or direct democracy. But we tend to forget that for them, democracy was not a, a goal, it was a medium, while also identifying revolution outside the seizure of state power. In 2017, so this new proposal arrived in conjunction with the CNI, they created the Consejo Indígena de Gobierno and appointed Maria de Jesus Patricio Martinez, known as Marichu, as a spokeswoman to contain in the Mexican presidential elections of 2018. Some wrongly understood this action as an attempt to create a political party or make their way into traditional politics. They perceive it finally, like a way to give a space to civil society in the task of the state. Certainly, there were mixed messages, but the opposite was true. Their decision was based on a national balance of their current situation. They perceive an aggravated scenario of dispossession, destruction, violence, and death. So they decided to travel around the country to open a dialogue with different sectors of society, share their struggles and strategies, to ask people to organize and to organize not in a vanguard party, but among themselves with their own ways and means. In effect, in the 78 discourses given by Marichu in this uh, tour around Mexico, she only mentioned democracy three times, whereas the word of organization was mentioned in all of them except one. So why? What kind of organization were they promoting if it's not democratic? So the message or the underlying their action was to struggle for life, to stay alive, preserve nature in its broader sense, and create futures and other worlds. So what attracted people from different milieu was its general object, to stop expanding capitalism and seek ways to care for life and dignity collectively. Since then, luchar por la vida, to struggle for life, has become a slogan and reference for many mobilizations, projects, and revolts in Mexico and in the world. The Zapatista initiative, A Journey for Life, that arrived in Europe uh, last summer is just an example of that. In the series of communication that announced this planetary journey, Zapatistas neither promoted a democratic organization. The word democracy has not appeared at least in the last two years in, in their communiques. They highlighted the importance of unity and diversity to refresh our gaze and work together against the destruction of the world. So are they leaving behind the struggle for democracy and positioning the quest for global emancipation through a different agenda? So next, I want to go into why we should t rethink democracy. And for that, I want to quote first um, the subcomandante Marcos. Um, he said, we don't know about you. But if we Zapatistas were lazy in our thinking, we would belong to an institutional political party. Critical thought has as its motto the act of questioning. Why this and not something else? Why this way and not another way? Why here and not in another place? As we Zapatistas said, one walks by asking. In that spirit is that I reflect on the idea, the practice, and the desire of democracy. So as you know, democracy has many, many surnames, like liberal, electoral, dominant, hegemonic, western, but also radical, subaltern, confederated, popular, plural, substantive, just to name a few. But why are such dissimilar processes rooted under the same name? What does the diversity have in common? Is lying behind them real democracy? 
It is clear that democracy has become a battlefield, but do we want to reduce our struggles to a battle for one world? For me, since social struggles are epistemic struggles that questions our ways of thinking, understanding, and ordering the real, we should be really careful not to render alternative perspectives and knowledge invisible. We should keep our, our grammar open to avoid blocking our political emancipation and fixing our creative power. So is democracy expanding or shrinking our imaginable futures? Is it threatening the creative force of social struggles such as that of the CNIN and ZLN? I'm aware, as Rancière identified, of the dangers of the hatred of democracy. And believe me, I don't want to nourish that. I just want to draw attention to how democracy enmeshes people's lives deeply into structures of powers, meanings, and representation to sustain capitalist social relations, rather than liberating other forms of organization. It is not that democracy is being absorbed by authoritarianism, as was discussed this early in this morning, or that is, the distinction is erasing. At the end, grazia means power or authority. So I really don't understand why the rise of authoritarian politics and reactionary populism is largely identified as a threat to democracy. And what is exactly the relationship between authoritarianism, capitalism, and democracy? The answer for me goes beyond how authoritarian leaders such as Trump, Bolsonaro, or Lopez Obrador in Mexico have been elected democratically, or how popular referendum means corruption and destruction of nature. It points out how democracy was born in inequality and was established around the globe by imposition. Moreover, it exhibits how democracy expresses the contradictions of capital and not, not the destruction of capitalist social relations. So I don't have much time left, I think, but um, I just want to summarize four of its problems. Um, the first one for me is that, um, that it has like hierarchies and borders. Democracy establishes always a limit between those who, who have and do not have a voice, being slaves, women, indigenous people, or migrants. So at the same time, paradoxically, it eliminates the division between exploited and exploiters. It obscures domination and canalizes social unrest to institutional channels. In this, way, on the one hand, it homogenizes subjects, universalizing a dominant culture, while on the other hand, creates differences and barriers that lead to multiple forms of oppression and domination. So just to wonder, like within our communities, who can participate and under which conditions? How as women, we relate to democracy as a main project? The second one is imposition and authoritarianism. Mignolo argues that democracy is being an has been an instrument for imperial expansion that has led to the consolidation of capitalism as an economic system. Um, it, of course, you can also uh, read uh, in the for uh, forthcoming book uh, that we are publishing in ERGAC, the work of Pedro, that he's also talking about um, there's no clear rupture between democracy and authoritarianism, as this distinction is a product of the modernity discourse. So, okay. So I will go a little bit faster because I have a minute left. So, um, so for me, like, however, rather than identifying democracy within a, like with a bad Western imperial project, I wonder if any kind of democracy, not only liberal, escapes the logic and relationship of, of colonial and patriarchal domination. The next one is anthropocentrism. And this one relates how democracy seeks the common good, but what is common and who decides this, and who is included. So if we believe um, that we, are, we live in an interconnected world, shouldn't we be thinking about our relations on broader terms? I think here, echo anarchies contends that organization should be through self-governing participatory communities that place at the center collective meaning. So rather than talking about empowerment and governments of humanity, shouldn't we consider the way in which humans and other forms of life interact, deliberate, and balance together life? And the final um, one is the lack of imagination and hopelessness. 
So we have reduced our struggle against capital to a struggle for democracy, to democratize capitalism, and in this way we have given up revolution. Democracy is a fake hope waiting for things to get better without acting. But what is exactly the meaning of revolution today? Uh, Gudinas invites us to provide a new meaning that questions development, moves beyond the modernity, and restores the value of life with the co-participation of non-humans. So we'd, we should ask ourselves, what are the sparks of hope that still emerge from different revolutionary practices and processes around the globe telling us to understand really what is going on and what can we do? And well, in the next part, I will talk more about that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ines. So now uh, we are going to give the floor to Asise Aslan. Uh, she's also a researcher in the uh, Universidad Autónoma de México, and she works uh, with uh, communal economies and practices of autonomy in connection between uh, Kurdistan and the Zapatist movement, and also in other places of Latin America. I added that part. But. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Darío. Buenas tardes. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, so I would like to start by greeting and thanking the International Research Group on Authoritarianism and Counter Strategies and Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung for organizing this meet meaningful conference. And thank you uh, for being here. After the long period of pandemic, this meeting is exciting for many reasons. Maybe you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but especially when we see that the state regimes, but also social relations themselves have be became more authoritarian in pandemic administration. However, when we speak of authoritarianism, we must stop thinking only of authoritarian regime or governments. The struggle against authoritarianism doesn't end purely against authoritarian governments, nation states, institution of colonialism, international arrangements, or the hegemony of capitalism. Often the main percentage of struggle is about transforming our everyday life, relationship, and our struggle and organization. So I want to, to open discussion in this point. For this, I plan my presentation in two parts. The first part contains my synthesis on the form of the organization of the Kurdish and Zapatista struggles. And the second part is about the social and autonomous struggle of Rojava as a movement. So I want to talk about what and how we can do against domination by our democratic way. The Kurdish struggle and Rojava is my main research area, but just I will to mention that Chiapas, I mean Zapatistas, has always is a mirror in my understanding and interpretation of Kurdish process. The Zapatista and Kurdish movements aim and realize a profound social transformation from their communities. And they know that this means transforming their own form of organization as a movement. But the problem is not to just create a horizontal organization. So the thing is more complicated. Maybe you know, I, I'm thinking like this, the social movements like Arab Spring or Istanbul Gezi and Occupy Street which emerged in the last decades, have pursued open and horizontal process, now like Chile. This, this means a trans social transformation by non-partisan process, spontaneous and massive mobilizations, because they have been formed on the rejection of the hierarchical structures of the traditional left, the understanding of our vanguard and revolutionary violence. But all these rebellions have ended with more authoritarian regimes or liberal party institutionalizing the hope and democratic form these movements are trying to build. 
That is why sometimes it's easier to take to street march, demon, uh, demonstrate or form multitude of the political parties and call on states and governments to establish democracy through rule and institution than to organize and work a profound social transformation from our daily life. When we observe Kurdish and Zapatista movements that organized autonomous in northern Syria and Chiapas, we see a few things that might be useful to think about during this conference. I'm going this one. This is the first one is the, the revolutionary process has become a popular revolution. One is because the revolution has no objective of taking power or creating an institution of power, like state. Is the second, the civil population participate actively and massively and becomes the authority, authority in the construction of, construction of autonomy. This is a, a dynamic to eliminate the classic fragmentation of the organization and society. I mean, it's breaking the vertical relationship between the organization and society. The second, the issue of organizing and being organized is central in, the, in both moments. They don't believe we can change the world without organization. Yes, they pursue transformation without power, but not without organization. In other words, they give a lot of importance, energy, and resources of, to community self organization, but with democratic and critical organizations. As revolutionary organization, they have the capacity to adapt the needs of the struggle. I mean, they listen to communities in which they are organized and to translate in the concrete politics. That is to say, the future of the struggle is determined around the needs of identified by the people, not from above by the organization. For they have radically changed and transformed the organization structures and concept of their struggle. This often causes fear in other organizations because they think if they change forms, they will lose their militants. They're, therefore, the organization becomes rigid. But the history of these two movements shows that the ability to in, ensure the functioning of the new structure, language, including the change of political position and ideologies, empower the organization, not debilitates them. On the contrary, they des destroy and rebuild their organization, but continue to experiment. They work with some mechanism for internal transformation and to avoid the creation of micro powers into the movement by these mechanisms. For the Kurds, for example, these mechanisms are critics, self-criticism, tech mill, platform. For the Zapatistas, they are, they are interpellar, vigilar. For each one is a concrete praxis. When I, I don't have a time to explain, uh, but in short, all these mechanisms, they seek transformation as a collective subject not the transformation of individuals. Um, the value, uh, value in use and collective necessity has become a founding element of community relation in based on reciprocity, relationship, community or communal economy, collective work that they organize under autonomy is very fundamental in these organizations. Also, the antagonistic role of women is determined in the process of struggle, revolution, and autonomy. Women have their own autonomous organization and are subject of collective feminine decision making. They have been able to establish and maintain networks of international solidarity and to devote time and energy to creating a new understanding of internationalism. They establish international solidarity as mutual empowerment. 
Finally, because all of this, the struggle and the life are identical in them. That is to say, the struggle is the organization of life and there is no fragmented life out of the struggle. So I'm paused in this part and in the second part, I would like to uh, talk concrete in Rochava. Thank you very much, Asisa. Um, so now the floor is for Katia Valenzuela Fuentes. She's a Chilean activist and researcher from the Universi Universidad de Concepción. And she's also a researcher for the Center of Sustainability, Sustainability Organ de Urban Development in Chile also. And he worked focused on Latin America and social movements, grassroots organization, and critical epi Stimulations. Um, so that was a difficult word. Uh, so, Katia, for is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dario. Um, thank you very much to everyone who is joining us today. Um, I'm very excited. It's my first face-to-face uh, -face conference since 2019, I think. So I'm very happy, just like Ines and Asise. Um, and uh, while I was uh, listening at uh, the, the presentations in the morning, it came to my mind this um, very nice um, phrase of John Holloway. And he says this, if we start with domination, then there is a great danger that we enclose ourselves, that we entrap ourselves within the structures of dominations that we want to criticize. It's important to start with something that is not closure, with something that is openness, with breaking. In other words, it's important to start with dignity. It's important to start with ourselves. And I think somehow this panel today um, it tries to go and to move towards that direction by showing how these um, ex this, this experiments of uh, more spectacular, I would say, the ones that uh, Ines is presenting and Asisa is presenting, and other perhaps less spectacular as the Chilean ones I'm going to share with you now, but to start with the force of dignity, to start with, with the force of emancipation, I think. Um, so I'm going to do the same as Ines and Asise. I'm going to start with 10 minutes, um, trying to explain a little bit of uh, the current Chilean situation. And I cannot start uh, by today, because I think the, the Chilean history somehow shifted from 2019, October 2019, with this uh, statement, Chile woke up. Uh, we had the, one of the most significant uprisings in Chile since since the return of democracy, and all the streets uh, were full of people. Millions of people actually came into the streets demanding, uh, demanding many things. Uh, this started as a struggle uh, against the, the increase of the transportation uh, fares. Uh, but at the end, it became this is, uh, you could see this is strong critique of Chilean, the, the whole Chilean neoliberal project that one of the presenters actually talked about in the morning the commodification of life and the structural inequality. And one of the interesting things about democracy and what we, we've been invited to talk today is that. Um, in these first weeks of the uprising in Chile, uh, you could see this, uh, this big critique of representative democracy, of liberal democracy. So there was this huge distrust in politicians, in central and local government, in the parliament, in all these institutional bodies. So uh, people into the streets didn't believe that changes were going to be made through this channel. To, through this path, which is quite interesting considering now that we have a progressive left-leaning government and a constitutional process going on. So one of the things that, that you could see uh, during the, the pricing in 2019 was that we, we faced uh, that in this uh, multiple uh, organizations as well who took over the streets and people took taking over the, the streets, you could see that the rejection was not only about capitalism. Um, there were some symbols like people targeting at the shopping centers, for example. So that was the, the violence was targeting at the shopping centers, like the infrastructure, but not only towards that. You can see there, that's a picture of my city. So where like this um, statue of the conquerors, you know, uh, the colonizers were taken down. And, but also we had a critique so to colonialism, 
to colonial structures, a critique to patriarchy that we could t see clearly through all the performance of uh, the rapist in your way that became international as well from Chile, and a critique to um, the state as well. So taking some, uh, I think, um, um, borrowing some of the thoughts that, that became famous in Argentina in 2001, que se vayan todos, that they all must leave. So that were some of the, the phrases that you could see in the streets in Chile in 2019. So there was this rejection of multiple um, structures of oppression, and the response from below, which is I'm more interested in, was this, what's the, the streets taking over by people, local organizing, this flourishing of territorial local assemblies, people getting together for the first time in decades. So some sort of like this kind of people got to know each other in their neighborhoods, which was something that neoliberalism did so well in separ separating us and dividing us. And, and unfortunately, the response from above was not very aligned with the, this response from below. And I wonder if there is any form that these two responses get together at some point. That, that, that's like one of my... my my questions about it. So the, the response from above, from the um, institutional politics, I will say, it's this agreement for peace and the new constitution. So this came as an, uh, just to give you some context, it gave as a necessity to stop the protest and the riots and the pricing. So then you see the uh, current president actually of Chile is in that photo, uh, seated with all the kind of right wing politicians because this was, uh, this was seen by, by social movements as a way to stop the protest and the pricing in Chile. So they, then they channeled you know, the politics to, into this institutional form. And that came along with a lot of repression. We have now, um, well, people that died in the, in the pricings. There were, we have a lot of mutilated uh, people. Their eyes were um, mutilated by the, the guns of policemen, police forces. So that was the response from above. Um, and I just wanted to give a bit of a time for, of explaining the institutional path because I think it kind of, um, it shows this difference with this path from below that I will be explaining more in detail in the second part because I don't have much time. Um, and basically, uh, what we've been dealing with in the last two years is that we had a referendum in October 2020 where 78% of the population voted yes. Yeah, super. Uh, to change Pinochet's constitution, the dictator's constitution. And, and then there were elections in May 2021, last year, uh, to to get the seats of the people who were gonna write the constitution. So that was a victory for left-leaning independents and, in and left-wing parties. Um, so they got seats in this constitutional convention and there was also the elections for governors and councils and mayors. And there was this victory of left-leaning candidates, which is interesting because in December last year, we had the presidential elections, and the, at, in the second round, Boric, which is the actual the, the, the president today, who is like a left-leaning uh, president, um, fought with Cast, which is a far-right candidate who got 40 40% 40, uh, of support in the second round. So we ha we're having like a, our Bolsonaro version in Chile with a lot of support. And, and it seems quite interesting how it shifted from this uh, support of the, of the left in the, in the 2021 early and then this lot of support for the far right candidate. And we are now in 2020, uh, this year actually, in, in September, there has to be another referendum to approve or reject the new, the, the new constitution. A new draft uh, is coming. It came just uh, last week, I think. So we so supposedly the entire Chilean population needs to decide whether it, this is approved and rejected. Just to give some a brief update about this. Now there is this far-right um, strategy to, um, 
to ask people to reject the constitution because there are some interesting changes in the in the new draft, um, and and there is this uh, uh, increasing rhetoric narratives of uh, against migrants and the call for security. So we are kind of seeing again very similar trends and those that uh, we, you were discussing in the morning and I probably they are discussing in the next uh, room as well. Um, and with this, I finished my first uh, round part. Um, this institutional path has been um, supported or partly built by some um, actors of the social of social movements. So some sectors of Chilean social movements decided to join this uh, struggle and to choose the institutional path to 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 achieve change. Um, for example, now this, this I put out there a picture of this. Uh, she's a very well acknowledged um, um, housing struggles uh, leader, and she are now joined like the Ministry of Housing with with the new president, um, and and some yeah, a lot of social environmental activists also decided to join the constitution uh, in order to enact change from this platform. Uh, however, that's not the entire panorama, that's not the entire kind of situation of Chilean politics. We also have, uh, the, the, so the, there's this picture I share, I share with you in the, in the other side, which is like, uh, I don't vote, I, I organize myself, which is kind of re resonates with this idea of our dreams don't fit in your ballot. Uh, boxes. So uh, I want to share with you in the second part, like what's about this kind of grassroots organizing and how they didn't really fit into all this kind of more institutional layout of, of Chilean politics. Thank you very much, Katia. So now I will give the floor to you. So if there is any question on commentar? I think that's. Uh, we don't have a microphone for you. I don't know, Gustavo, is possible? Well, I don't think it's, I think if you shout or if you talk loud, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be, it, it, yeah, it's okay. So, okay, yeah. So here we have our first, uh, first question. I would say that all of you intervene and then we collect the, the, your interventions and then the floor would be to the panelists. So. Please. Thank you for your great presentations. Uh, uh, my question is for, um, actually two questions. First for Inej, why is the Zapatista movement's position in terms of um, global politics and its position um, in a world that is so much globalized? Um, and also what, 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 what kind of uh, political policies they, they propose for, you know, within the project they, 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 um, they defend. And for, for Katia, I would like to ask you to talk a bit more about the criticism or critics to, to the new, um, new government, the new uh, president within, within the left itself, because I heard that, uh, well, it's not so much from below. <laughs> uh, so I would like you to elaborate a bit more about that. So? Yeah, I would like to ask the three of you, uh, what is the relationship between the, the, these movements and the, 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 the actual state? Katya said something about the, the, the existing state. You said something about that, but maybe in Kurdistan and the Zapatistas, what's the, the relationship in terms of uh, violence and negotiation? Easy question, another one. <laughs> <laughs>
still useful for what you're saying. So I would I would recommend that the last intervention that we are going to have the last intervention because they are very so we can debate the whole night or the whole day in, in this question. So maybe one intervention more. Javier, one intervention more, ¿le parece? Sí, sí. Así nos gustan chocolate. Okay, zero interventions. So why not? Thank you very much. Uh, so now, uh, who wants to start? Or we are going to repeat the same process? Because you're yeah. like, you want I to don't talk? mind. Check, check. Okay. okay, let's go with Ines. OK, great. Um, well, um, I will try to answer the questions with the things more or less I have prepared. So. So well, I did identify these four problems uh, with, um, within democracy, and of course these problems might not represent a novelty. So I'm clearly not the first one to criticize it. Um, I just want to build from here my main concern, and this goes to, to Pedro's question, right? So my main concern with democracy is that it might not be sufficient to fight the civilization crisis. Is it enough to stop pandemics, devastation, and climate change? So why those are we walking towards our extinction, right? So we have been losing sight of our interconnection and interdependence in the world. And this one uh, connect, like here connects with Boa's um, question that, uh, well, the CNAE and the Zapatistas have indeed pointed out that um, the need to identify capitalism as our common enemy around the globe, and a knowledge that our survival depends on the multiple and diverse struggles around the globe to destroy it. This perspective is not something new. Like since 1998, um, the Zapatistas began to be more concerned with the reconstruction of their peoples from the communitarian to the international level, to become a struggle with and for humanity. And so in, in this way, like replying a little bit to the question of Mariano, well, they stopped living like being a national liberation movement because they decided to just stop any negotiation with the state. Um, so they wanted to provide a broader uh, perspective of revolution. So nowadays, I think they are pushing this further, like by raising uh, a struggle under the slogan to struggle for life. But what exactly do they mean by that? So the Zapatistas have told us that we cannot understand life in opposition to death because to live, we die. Rather, they understanding in opposition to the economy, money versus life. So it is to return the richness of every single thing, person, and action in the world away commodification. So I don't want to romanticize like their struggle, but I just want to share how I'm, I'm being inspired of the need of moving away an anthropocentric perspective within politics. Um, the idea is to place at the center the curve of life. So why focusing on the people if we aim to think differently about our relationship with nature? And, and in the work of uh, Silvia Marcos, a feminist that has been a, accompanying and the Zapatista movement for a long time, she has seen how uh, in the Zapatista philosophy and that of other indigenous people is rooted in a cosmocentric perspective. This means that the human is no longer at the center. It is the cosmos, the universe. Humans and non-humans, plants and everything that exists and is interconnected. For me, perhaps it's not really cosmocentric. I really don't like the 
to think about a center, but more like a net, like a cosmo net perspective. So I want to, to, to expand on, it, on this to, so you can get a better idea of what I'm trying to say. And I want uh, to share with you something. Um, Mario Luna, who is a spokesman of the tribu Yaki in the north part of the country, uh, that he was, he was explaining to me about how to take a decision just be, because of being oneself is so easy. But for his community, the tribu Yaki, it's not, a, it's not that easy. And I quote, the Yaki is our ancestors, those presents and those to come. So when you do an analysis taking into account all of this, it is not easy to reach agreements and positions. We are thinking about all this that is not just those who had at this moment have a voice. The Jackie at the moment is giving voice to those who have already died. He's giving a voice to those of us who are here, but he's also giving a voice to the river. He's giving voice to the forest, to the mountains, the sea. So of course, when you, you think about this, uh, for me, it's just incredible. And one of the main um, lessons I have had learned from different communities organizing the CNAE is how life and territories are not inseparable. And of course, yeah, we can di discuss a little bit of that. Uh, for them, they are just not like only pieces of land. Territories are everything, like from rain to mountains, from newborns <laughs> to ancestors, from language to celebrations, from history to myths. It is a cosmos from which it is possible to guarantee life reproduction. So, I don't know, against the ideas of progress and extractivist projects, a vision beyond democracy might prove useful that consider this like transhistorical binding and life generating community. So, of course, like the main question also is, is, is about surviving and living. Because, um, as Raúl Bannerheim uh, recently said in a, in a book that honored uh, the Zapatista movement, survival is a postponed death. So the daily actions that these movements are doing are, like, are just accompanying with organization for the care and enjoyment of the territory, of their lives. So in the words of the Zapatista, living is not only not dying, it is not surviving. To live as human beings is to live with freedom. Living is art, it is science, joy, dance, to fight. But how exactly do we live when surviving has become more urgent? So women in this struggle have, teach, have taught me a lot about this, of how we need to break hierarchies and division and wave community, a brother we through mutual recognition. A world where many words fit, so of course, and the plural words that many academics are talking about this. And, well, in some sense, the main objective of this planetary journey that the Zapatistas proposed uh, last year uh, has been this articulation of alternatives to, to exchange experiences, perspectives, ideas, and strategies while building synergies to organize relations differently and guide us collectively towards global emancipation. And here I, I just want to, to, to also share with you something that Bettina Cruz, a Venus activist uh, of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, that is um, like in Oaxaca, if you like in the shorter part of Mexico. Um, so in a conversation, he was explaining to me about this internationalist proposal. So, for her, the aim is that everybody makes their struggle their own. So when people in different geographies mobilize in support, should be understood not as solidarity towards them, but as solidarity towards the life we all defend. That is for her reciprocity. So of course, Zapatistas are considered forerunners of the alter globalization movement, and that they have consolidated a network of support. Unfortunately, only few are still organizing. So how exactly do we reach more people? How do we spread enthusiasm, provoke empathy, and act not as individuals, but as a collectivity that experiences a climate catastrophe? So I, I connect this question to the final point I want to bring up. So the crisis of imagina imagination to prevent the, the civilization collapse. So recently I was reading this book of Amador Fernandez Sabater, 
that proposes that to confront our impotence, we should provide new perspective, words, and gestures, and to re relate with images differently for the transformation of the world. So this is exactly what I think that CNAE and Zapatistas are doing through the struggle for life. Just think about uh, how the Zapatistas decided during the pandemic that they will sail across the ocean to encounter rebels in Europe and join them in the struggle. Something so surreal was possible. They made it possible. So this embodied response, for me, is, a, is becoming a reference, a new anti-capitalist image and language for social emancipation, hoping to remind us that we're still alive and other words are indeed still possible within this deadly scenario. So by putting life at center, they are also leaving behind democracy as the horizon of emancipation and focusing on this kind of cosmonet that promises that life can thrive. So for me, well, at the end, my work um, as an activist researcher, and I think like of most people like trying to, to think about this, should be to be participant in the creation of this new grammar to reestablish hope. And for that, the last we can do, the last thing we can do is to ask radical question about what already exists, such as is democracy enough to fight against the global civilization crisis? So thank you. Thank you, Ines. So who wants to continue? Yeah, yeah. Okay, Asise, the floor is yours. I think this this question is very uh, difficult to answer, very uh, short and concrete. But I think maybe uh, my intervention is the just I prepared maybe respond to your uh, question, Ulke. But before this, I want to say about uh, is that this moment, yeah, is territorial moment, Kurdish moment and Zapatista moment. But we we. We cannot thinking about like the, all the people living in this territory support these moments. I mean, it's not pearl territory. Also, this territory is the, under the war. I mean, the Kurdish, Kurdish region and also the Patista region in the, uh, living under the war. And this create, okay, the territory is a possibility for, for example, for organizing in the population, but also is the limited. The, the form of the organizations. But I think in the Kurdish and Zapatista movement, making a, a, a good thing, they lived from the, their territory and going to another territory. I mean, the, for example, going to Latin America for Kurdish and Zapatista coming to here in Europe and interchange the, the struggles and make a, um, or change the the sense of territory. The territory is uh, convert like uh, where we are organized and the territory is, is here. Um, and also, for example, the, the question about the violence and the negotiation, I think in the violence and negotiation is the same. Is also, the, they have that same result. For example, the uh, the violence or the negotiation in the Rojava in the in this in the they continue in there, and they just just want to um, to people just to leave the their organization and organize the institution and or rule, but uh, rule and institution create the state, create the domination and patriarchy and capitalism, and for this I mean. There is a not difference between this this way of the domination or this way of the authoritarian um, ways. I mean, and also democracy is useful. Democracy, I think, is a um, like a very institutional uh, practice and very institutional concept. I think it's not useful, but the democratic way is democratic praxis, democratic process, I, I think is useful. For example, when I going to speak, I will talk about how in Rojava they organize the democratic way of the, the organization, and this way is useful. And there is 
democracy, not to like a democracy, a liberal democracy, but democracy from below, democracy from people, there is a make a very big sense in everyday life. Mm, yeah, I'm going to <laughs> the second part of the, my intervention. And so, for example, if you look into all the lecture about the autonomy of Rojava or in original document of the Kurdish movement itself, they mention about four, four uh, structures, the democratic confederalism, they saying the commons, assemblies, cooperative, and academies. And they are described as a structure of the autonomous administration and defined as a static institution. But my observation in, in Rojava, when I uh, make my investigation, it's, it's very contrary. Commons or, uh, commons or assemblies are space, not physical, where social relations are reproduced and they are new, non-static form of the relating we change the capitalist relation between people. I will, uh, I will explain how how this, this place is not, not physical or not uh, static. For example, communes are, communes, you know, is the, the basic organization of the autonomy in Rojava and where daily life and collective needs are configured in Rojava. They are organizing in different areas at the same time. Education, health, self-defense, justice, economy, culture, aesthetic, and other uh, uh, needs of the community. As a community, people first discuss in common assembly where all the people can participate in this assembly. That is not rep representation problem. They produce collective decision but also instrument and the politics to cover their own collective needs. I mean, it's not that they talking about for decide, also, they talking about and discuss about how we can uh, realize our decisions. And um, so they experience autonomy directly from their neighborhoods and village. And this happened independently of any ideology. I mean, it's that they, they are not all the support to democratic confederalism, but they living in common and the participate assemblies. Because in common action, action and as a different political approach, religions and ethnic different differences can coexist thanks to democratic nation exercise. Maybe you, you want, we can talk later about the democratic nation. In Rojava, the assembly dynamics is a, like a movement because all the decisions are taken collectively under the assembly form to which are aided to assemblies called for election system of delegation and representation of the autonomous government. I mean, there is a, some, some uh, assemblies uh, for election or for delegation or for just the political decision, but there is another huge experience about the assemblies is the, for just organizing life. This uh, dynamic organization, uh, I mean, is the uh, democratic confederalism. Uh, they have a, 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 a way of the organization, the organiz organizing by dimensions. When it say dimension, it means a need that is fundamental for collective life, such as healthy culture, justice, economy. I mean, is the self-defense. All these nine dimensions are mentioned uh, by Ojalan, maybe you know, but they can more and less, but community decide all dimension for the organizing of communal society. Each dimension and all dimension are organized in the all communes, municipalities, academies, congress, and platforms. Actually, in all autonomous areas. And each dimension is organized from the smallest and the largest region, and they articulated between uh, them. It means the people who are in charge uh, of organizing a dimension in a commune, for example, the social economy, are connected to all the people who are in the same position in the same canton. They form the assembly of economic coordination in the canton. According to co-participation principle, 
they are two people, spoke, uh, spokesperson uh, they saying, a woman and a man, who are in charge and with the economic actors, I mean is the trades, workers, farmers, they constitute the economic assembly in their region. It can be in a municipality or the, in the canton or the, in the commune. In this way, they are created hundreds of assemblies at the same time in the economic dimension from the communes, municipalities, cities, up to canton and for the all economic sector. What I mean for each dimension that creates hundreds of assemblies when it organized and all the dimension of the democratic confederalism formed thousands and thousands of assemblies where people participate directly. In some, in, in, say, uh, in some way or by one and another more assemblies, all people being part of the autonomous process. For example, I was very impressed to see that every day after five o'clock in afternoon, there is, a, an, uh, there is a, an assembly meeting for everyone. An ordinary day in Rojava, for example, people go to work at uh, 9 a.m and uh, working uh, until 2, 2 p.m. Then they go home, eat, rest, or doing the anything personal. But after the 5 a.m., they going, they leaving the their home and going to a, a assembly. Mm. Really, it's, it's very, it's very um, exciting to uh, see people to mobilizing and leaving the, their home and going to an uh, assembly for, for the decide uh, about their life and or discuss about the, their life. Two minutes, yeah. <laughs> but I, I, Don't talk, worry. I talk in the first time. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So I mean, is the, in this way, for example, people talking about or discuss about the water, or the, another another assembly talking about the self-defense, another assembly talking about the justice. But the people talking about this issue in uh, uh, in uh, another uh, uh, assemblies. Mm. So assemblies create a movement. They are people mobilizing to decide about their life. I mean, for the self-determination, not only politically and all the old life and they they discuss what how 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 want to uh, live so um, in in this way i think is therefore the, the, the self determination is the is the change and the passing the limited the, just the like identity issue or the just the political issue and they they convert the, their life issue Mm. So for this, I, I, I'm uh, described the, the process of Rojava is the, 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 the all the, the organizing is anti-capitalist organizing. Other uh, thing I, I want to share the distinguished way assembly form of Rojava is mutual reporting system between the lower and upper assemblies and the report are they they writing the report, but they don't send the report. They participate the assembly and the present. For example, the assembly is present is it report to assembly, which it is addressed by the spoken uh, spoken persons. This practice is called techmil, which in means reporting that includes criticism and the self criticism of the fulfillment of responsibilities in the process of carrying out common decision. And this not happening from the lower to the upper, the way the lower assembly is reporting the upper one. The upper assembly also attend the lower assembly and present its report. This breaks the creation of the hierarchical, hierarchical uh, structure between the assemblies before reports were presented only orally, since many people, because are not used the writing, now they are also uh, present in writing, but again, the presented orally. I mean, the, for the 
giving to a report and assembly, some people going to participate and assembly each address it, and in this way they articulate between the, not the, between just the, uh, sending the cards or report, they articulate with people, I mean is the, with the body. <laughs> mm. So there are many more practice I can talk, for example, the collective word or com why, uh, how women organize the their autonomous uh, uh, things. But uh, I can say the self-determination process in Rojava mobilized the people for the uh, uh, participate the assemblies and participate the commons or cooperatives, but make a, a part of the subject of the decision all the autonomy process. Thank you. Thank you, Asisa. So, Kata, Katia, do you want to, to wait? So the, no, do you have, fine. I yeah, think, yeah. is it uh, working? See? And see. We are having technical problems. Maybe if you want, you can you can start and during the time. Yeah, it's okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. Okay. Um, it should be connected, but uh, yeah, no. Is it, uh, I open it from the desk, from here. So yeah, but it's not connected to the yeah. To it's the okay. Team. Okay. No, it doesn't really matter because uh, this is not the pictures part, so it's fine. So. Um, Okay, so in this second part, I'd like to talk a little bit about this uh, politics from below, which is this, uh, uh, the first part I was telling you a little bit about kind of this, how this institutional path moved in the last uh, years in Chile. Um, but this, um, what I was saying that some movements somehow fed the institutional process, there were lots of movements and uh, community organizing projects, I will say, that decided not to uh, give their energy to the institutional path in Chile. Um, this is a long-term tradition. It's not something that just happened now in 2019 in Chile. Um, movements uh, have found inspiration in the Zapatistas in the 1994, in all the kind of Occupy movements as well ar around the world. Um, we even had in the 70s, you know, and all kind of the Chilean way to socialism, some groups, revolutionary groups, which were not really sure in, in this uh, way, electoral way to socialism. So there is a long-term history of, of um, um, a kind of will say a trend within Chilean politics that um, has not been very keen to join the institutional battle, as we call. So, um, in in terms of uh, this this politics, I would call it politics from below. In this, the Chile, the post uprising Chile, um, there are many different experiments. And I will then I use democracy, and I just I'm going to be answering to, to your questions, like uh, radical democracy. And I think there, when when you ask the question if the, is it the 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 concept uh, useful at all, I think um, perhaps politically what is not useful is to think in democracy as this kind of liberal arrangement. You know, the kind of the idea of representative democracy. That's what I, I would say. Maybe that that's not not useful, uh, but to me, and I don't know, it's like, it's a very interesting question because when I was thinking about the name of the panel, I was thinking, should, should I kind of say more about the word? But then, okay, but it's not what people are very interested in in the kind of uh, the uh, movements themselves. What I think will be interested is to, is to think in, in this kind of claim back the, the, our self-governing capacity. So democracy as this way of claiming back how um, we, we, 
we, we deal with common issues uh, without uh, the state some sort of expropriating our capacity of self-governing. So I think that way, I think democracy as a concept, democracy, radical democracy, direct democracy, local democracies make more sense, to me at least. And I think that's a little bit of the narrative of these movements and collectives and, and projects that are, as I was saying at the beginning, are not as spectacular as Zapatista or as Rojava, but they are spreading all across uh, Chile. Uh, I'm focused on the urban and experiences because I come from the city and I think it ca kind of relates to what you were telling because in Chile we do have uh, like big experiences of autonomy as well in the countryside led by Mapuche people. So, which it, it today is a very big topic by itself. I'm not talking about it because it kind of goes a bit out of my presentation. Um, but definitely, uh, urban collectives, movements, draw on Mapuche autonomy as well and acknowledge, for example, the, um, the ancestral roots. This is something that uh, I think it resonates with what Ines was talking about as well about like non-anthropocentric, uh, politics as well, and, other, and someone in the morning said, how are we, thinking, are we thinking about another ontologies? How are we thinking about the way we understand life? And I think these movements ranging from territorial assembly, something very similar to what happened in Argentina in 2001, socio-environmental movements, movements por la defensa de la vida, which is the same, uh, la tierra, el territorio, so defending movements for, it's not this kind of, kind of very Western idea of, an, I don't know, a, a radical a climate change activism. In, in Latin America, we don't have that. We have like movements for the defense of territories. It's a very kind of much more broader understanding of, of, of life because there, there is, I think, this embracing of, of ancestral roots and uh, where there is no, there is no division I mean, we are defending human nature and non-human nature, and that's something that we learn from our ancestors and indigenous roots. Um, so we have these movements as well. Some of them joined the constitutional process, some of them didn't, and they are in their territories, uh, not only resisting corporate power, but also trying to create something different in their communities through, um, for example, ecological reforestation, trying to, uh, through community, uh, uh, environmental community projects, um, through different ways of, of, of building and creating community. Community kitchens, kind of taking the legacy of the 80s uh, in, in Chile, uh, Oya Comun, we say it in, in, in Chile, so people from vulnerable neighborhoods getting together to cook their meals for the entire community, so in times where the infl inflation in Chile is super high, um, and, and we have all these also kind of problems, increasing of poverty coming out of the pandemic, so community kitchens are spreading in, in, in vulnerable neighborhoods as well, food and worker co-ops, the idea of the co-ops as well, is spreading in different parts of the cities, um, and autonomous collectives, feminist, uh, alternative media, we only had, we just had like a couple of weeks ago a, a Chilean journalist who was murdered uh, in the 1st of May demonstration by kind of a street vendors. Um, very much aligned with the police forces who didn't protect her, she, she passed away, and she's from a very important alternative media um, group in Santiago. Um, so that this comes with the human rights collectives as well, who are playing an important role, and all the kind of campaigns demanding freedom for political prisoners in Chile after the pricing. So we have this kind of very diverse um, network of, of activism, and some of them are more territorially based, I will say, like based in their neighborhoods, like in the cities. Some of them are joined together by like um, um, a, a topic. Uh, but they share, I will say, uh, I want to share with you three main features. One of them is what I called affective politics and the politics of care. So we are not in the, in the language of the old traditional left, you know, we were, we're comrades and we join in the struggle. So we are building relationships of solidarity, of love, 
we share emotions, we are together in the struggles, in, in the struggle, in the protest, in the streets, but we take care of each other and, and we politicize everyday life. So the personal is political here, drawing on, femi on the feminisms that are getting so important in Chile as well. So collective care, mutual aid, and class solidarity are, uh, we see them through the community kitchens, through the community gardens, through the kind of ecological reforestation, uh, food co-ops, but not the neoliberal charity. We're not talking about that. We're talking about like embracing this, this care at a collective level from the grassroots. We're not waiting the government to come and solve the things for us, but we are doing it ourselves. So life, human and non-human, in care are at the core of this type of activism, which is, as I said, less spectacular and like spread and the underground, I will say. Um, and in this way, we are talking about um, uh, like this new, as I said, the embracing of ancestral roots and this, the idea of when vivir, which is very used, uh, sometimes a bit institutionalized, it's been in the constitutions, you know, in Ecuador and Bolivia, but this idea of living well that cannot be explained by the logic of, of um, Western you know, ontologies. Um, and another kind of common uh, feature of these movements is that they, when we're talking about this idea of democracy, you know, like uh, some people like activists in my com engagement with, act with activists with these communities, uh, coming from the environment, social environmental struggles, they're talking about territorial sovereignty. I don't know if that's the, the pronunciation. But that's a very interesting word that is not very used, you know, in the kind of discussions. Uh, but they, they, they use this concept as a way to reclaim the people's capacities to build their own processes of self-determination over their territories, which is pretty much, I think, goes very similarly to what Fasise was uh, explaining and definitely what Zapatistas do in Chiapas. Uh, so in this case, at a very micro scale, so from grassroots arts activities, popular education, taking kind of Paulo Freire's legacy into our everyday practices, networks of alternative economies as well, so in, uh, um, for example, through community markets, community networks for selling, exchanging goods, uh, or barter exchange systems, we call it trueque in, in Chile. Um, and I think that's another kind of interesting feature that all these movements share. And a third one I like to, with this I finish, is like the enactment of horizontality as a, a kind of key I, I will say like a, a move towards building a, another politics, horizontality, autonomy, and assembly-based politics. And I think that's something that the three pan, uh, panelists here share in the, in the same, as how we can imagine another ways for, of enacting politics. And this horizontality is expressed in non-hierarchical structures, in the rotation of roles, tasks, responsibilities, rotation of spokespersons or delegates as well. So there's not this big revolutionary leader, you know, no also like the, you know, the, the avant-garde or the, uh, that, that, that's not like the language that we're talking here. We're talking about consensus decision-making of assembly as the heart of collective practice and knowledge and collective knowledge production where like the knowledge is not uh, he, from only here, you know, it's in the it's in the base of, of, of movements themselves. From their knowledge is being produced, and and then from there we open dialogues. And just to finish, some final remarks. Um, so grassroots movements seek to create projects of self determination, and and here I use the word democracy, radical democracy at the micro level, and and this is uh, these movements I, I I was sharing a little bit with you today. What they do is they challenge the state-centered paradigms of social change, so we're not talking from that paradigm. They, they are trying to forge an anti-authoritarian and prefigurative political approach. They are not waiting for the revolution to come in the future. They're trying to live their lives differently from today. Um, and then, um, just to, to reply to your question, uh, I think, um, and, and with this I finish, um, 
the, the times and agendas of the institutional path, which I would put, for example, the, the, the progressive wave from the president, do not, I mean, definitely clash with the aims and purposes and, and of built by grassroots organizations because the coalition in power today is not a coalition built by movements. It's a coalition built by privileged, well-educated intellectuals and professionals from Santiago, from the capital. They, haven't, they don't have grassroots work. So they, they haven't been into the communities or have very little grassroots work. I think the, the, the parties or groups that were more involved in the grassroots, they left the coalition a while ago. Um, and they have moved towards the center. In order to win the elections, they moved towards the center and they've been considered by like more radical activists like the youngest son of Concertación, which was the kind of traditional coalition who got in power uh, after the dictatorship. So, and this, and definitely the, insti the, insti the pro institutional path has weakened social movements in Chile. This is a, it's a consequence of, a, this is what I'm claiming. I mean, I'm post talking from a positioning, but from what we're seeing from the social movements front, social movements have not been strengthened by all the institutional path. They've been weakened. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we need to take into account when we are doing, trying to do radical analysis about politics today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Katia. Uh, um, now we have like, um, yeah, maybe a few minutes for the last um, round of intervention and question. Gustavo has the microphone. If someone wants to ask, uh, it would be good if you can do it in order to the camera to, to receive the sound. Let's try. Darío. Ah, Darío. Uh, thank you for the, pres the three spectacular uh, presentations to quote Katya. My question is about, well, all three countries saw really, really big uh, feminist uprisings, let's say, or the, their expressions of, of processes where there's been a central role to female activists, to women in general in these processes. And I just uh, wanted to hear from all three. Katya was talking about that right now, but about all three. How does this uh, dimension of, of these political processes uh, is expressed in the questions that you handled earlier? So uh, feminist women in politics and this kind of organization. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting um, presentations. And I just want to throw in a few issues that make me thinking because I've been doing research on the same subject for a long time. And one is um, to which extent we, sh we should claim the, the term democracy because I think that every um, political and every, every, everything we do is also connected obviously to a public debate and there is a certain weight that democracy has. So supposed to be everything is democratic today. You can bump democratically a different country, you can do everything and everything is for democracy. So maybe to also make clear, um, because I think, and, and, and that's something that is still even strongly uh, rooted in, in, left, in, in the left, but to make clear that liberal democracy is not democratic. Liberalism and democracy are opposed to each other and they've been opposed for 250 years until democracy did exactly what you described differences the, the state from these movements to separate the political, the economic and the social sphere. So the moment that democracy was limited to the, to the democratic and representational um, political sphere, it was accepted as liberal democracy when everything was out. So. And also to fight the idea that is still strong also in the left that liberal democracy brought certain rights and it didn't, it didn't bring anything. I mean, it was compatible with uh, women not having the right to vote. It was compatible with rich people having four votes, et cetera. So the question is um, to make clear again and again, it's movements that gained these rights and not the democ liberal democracy itself. So that's why 
just drawing that in. The other thing is that I, um, I agree with all these ideas from the construction from below, but at a certain moment, you always will hit the point that the constituent power, so the institutionalized power, is always stronger than the constituent power, because it usually controls finances, military, um, public discourse, etc. So how to deal with that, I don't know how to deal with that, and it's something that is still unsolved for me, and which I've been thinking a lot about uh, over the past 10 years or more. Um, but to keep, like, to have this in, in the equation, so what do you do? I mean, we can, it's also not desirable that we can do, do all these things only in territories that are under war, you know, so that the state disappears and then we can do these things in a, war, in a prolonged war situation. I mean, that's not obviously the emancipation, idea of emancipation on a long term. <laughs> I don't think it is. Thank you, Dario. There is another question there. Yeah, and then, oh, okay, uh, she was first, but okay. Now, okay, you're going to go, okay. Thank you for, for all the presentations. I had like five or six comments, but... <laughs> okay, choose one, please. No, yeah, <laughs> just two. Uh, one of the issues is related to, um, you know, how the presentations help us to think not only about the question of democracy, but also the question of, of how we think the state, no? Specifically, if we conceive the state only as a tool of class domination or not. The, the, the short question is, is that, no? Is the state just a tool of class domination? My own answer is no. Um, there is a Marxist and left-wing argument for that. Maybe we can discuss later. But I think that it is still an open, open question, and I, I would like to, to ask you um, about that. The current Chilean uh, solution seems to answer no to that question. The Zapatista argument seems to answer yes to that question. So how do you face uh, the, the, the issue? And the second um, thing is about how we deal with, with anti-democratic practices within grassroots democracy building spaces. Um, uh, indigenous and black women um, have talked a lot about how inside democratic spaces or inside their communities there are a lot of anti-democratic practices. So how do we face uh, those contradictions and how uh, do, do we um, build real democratic um, relations within our popular movements or the popular actors that we accompany. Thank you. So, yeah, they are the end of the room. Thank you very much. Um, I love this topic. Um, and I, I love your, that you're bringing your territorial experiences as well. Um, I, I'm concerned about the climate crisis and the way these alternative democracies are considering their relationship to nature. And some, some of you talk about um, different ontologies or different ways of caring nature. Um, or common goods. I was wondering how you, how you see that relationship in practice in, in the different cases. And, um, and I'm, I'm not sure, and maybe that's directly to, to Katia, a question. Uh, I also come from Chile, and maybe we have like different interpretations of, of the process, but about the last thing you mentioned about the institutional um, class weakening the social and grass grassroots organizations. Do you see the the new constitutional process maybe as a as an opportunity for grassroots organizations, or or not really? Like, do you feel that it's m maybe um, 
like a cover covering or something like that for to like how do you say um cooptation exactly thank you <laughs> or or do you feel it could be real change you know thank you so the last question here sorry if someone has a question thanks i would like to know uh what you think about the venezuelan style venezuelan poder popular style which it seems to me to be very interesting although it's within within the scope of the state but i think there are processes of independent organizing or organization uh, from below both political but also in terms of production uh, which i think uh, also involves elements of assemblies and stuff like that i'm aware of how you know the state can sort of interfere and, and, and interfere in, in decision making of, of those assemblies. But I think um, I'm just trying to, you know, think uh, about like, can we, can we imagine um, a more democratic democracy, if you like, within, within a national state um, in cases where we can't imagine, you know, the dismantl dis uh, dismantlement of, of, of state as, 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 as an institution and as a structure. Thank you. Just a minute, we have a little debate here. So now we are going to have five minutes uh, for the panelists, and then we are going to close with another round of questions and fragments, and then the panelists can uh, answer and talk until yeah, they are going to evict us. Uh, so who wants to start? <laughs> Katya. <laughs> I can try. OK. okay. Um, so, so about feminism, uh, definitely there is like this huge influence of feminism in current movements in Chile. For example, I, I was kind of very involved in social environmental movements and activism, and, and now feminism is part of that of those struggles. And and that was not something that happened in I don't know early 2000s. It's something that's been happening in the I don't know last 10, 15 years. So the the and that what is what, it's very interesting because it it uh, forces. It forces people to change their their practices. For example, now there are like uh, procedures for, and I think that connects to the question of uh, how there are some anti-democratic practices within grassroots organizations. For example, in that case, you know, cases of harassment, sexual harassment within um, kind of activist spaces, which is something that you are all, maybe all of you have uh, had experiences with that. And now several movements are, are, are facing that and they have kind of uh, written procedures and like they do um, workshops as well and they have like uh, procedures for someone, if someone, so not accepting certain practices and that comes very much from fe from kind of the wave of feminisms um, in Chile and it's embedded now and and I think women um, feel a bit safer in kind of some mixed spaces other women they just decided to do in their separate ways and have their own kind of spaces because they they, they don't think it's enough so definitely the influence of feminisms is something that has shifted um, all movements in Chile and that's why it's even included in the kind of progressive left-wing government so the the like it's it's called a feminist government so it's also embedded somehow it it was impossible not to include it because of the force of feminisms in chile um so i don't think i can reply the the, the i don't think there is a truth about saying well is the state a tool for class domination uh, it's a very difficult one i think it is so that's i just go with my 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 ideas of it but uh, i but it, it, com it comes from a place of um, positioning myself. And I think it's also about, th there is no neutral talk here, you know, at all. So from my perspective, the state is a form Im embedded in capitalist relations. So, it's, so like, that's where I start from, my starting point. So I, I think, um, uh, and, and I think because I'm, I'm very kind of, um, um, 
I choose to, to think about that is that I'm very reluctant to see how the state can um, can be a, a, a mean for, for emancipation in the case of Chile or, or everywhere. Like, um, um, so, but at the same time, I, I, and I think I, I connected with the, some of the last questions, um, can be the constitutional process an opportunity for grassroots organizations. And I, I think I would be kind of half blinded if I don't acknowledge that there are interesting things going on in the constitutional process, um, the draft at least. So uh, for example, acknowledging like the, the Mapuche or like an originary and like indigenous people's languages and the right of uh, and water, not as a commodity. And now talking about the rights of nature as in Bolivia and Ecuador. Um, which we don't know if that constitution is going to be approved, but there are some interesting changes being promoted there. And there are some s structures, for example, the defense, uh, so it's as the, the, um, the nature is going to be considered to have rights, then there are going to be more um, institutions to defend, you know, and to be kind of, uh, they're, supposedly, they're going to be more, more institutions to uh, fight extractivism. So that might be an opportunity for grassroots organizations, but I, in my view, uh, one of the reasons why movements have been weakened, it's because they, they put all their energies into the constitutional process and they left the grassroots and their communities behind. And that's also, it's something that we've seen in other countries and in other experiences. And definitely there is cooptation as well. Now the people who were activists are now, now in the government, they are taking a side. And they are not taking the side of, of, not necessarily taking the sides of the movements because of this call to move towards the center. So I think there is uh, some red flags to take into consideration there. And I think I don't have more time, but maybe we would yep. have another we are, round. We yeah. have another round. Thank you, Katia. So, who wants to continue? Yep. Okay, okay. Así se. Yeah. Okay, my answer, it, uh, it will be very short. And about the two points, about the feminist and the nature. And, okay. For example, yeah, you know the Kurdish movement is to be recognized with the women organization and to also women with arm and women uh, soldier women. I mean, it is it is very um, difficult to explain. We are not just this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we are not just a woman with arm. We, we have a very big uh, social organization since 92. And for example, like researcher or the people from uh, outside of the, the region or outside of the struggle uh, describe the Kurdish women feminist, but Kurdish women don't um, define themselves like a feminist. Uh, we have a woman movement because we have a, a very multitude of the women and the participate the, the, is the, the social organization and to change the their uh, life or uh, the or patriarchal order, order in their life. And for this, the, 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 the organization, I mean, is the autonomous way of the organization of women. It's very... Um, uh, it has a very long time, I mean, it's not just uh, uh, since the 2014, and uh, from the uh, 92, uh, women organized, but, but also not just, uh, just organized or not uh, make a praxis uh, in their uh, life or in their family or with their uh, partner. Also, they thinking about their praxis and for these, for example, the Kurdish uh, women movement has a, a very um, uh, developed thinking about uh, how they can the change the or patriarchal order in the, their life and or their, in their community. I mean, is that, for example, there is a, a process uh, uh, starts with the uh, theory of the rupture and after that, now we're talking about the genealogy. I would like to say 
uh, just checking the how <laughs> what we say about uh, for example what we how we analyze the patriarchy and how we we analyze our praxis for the uh, destroyed is the patriarchal order and um, about nature is the, in, in Kurdistan, it's very difficult to talk about the nature because it's the nature destroyed by war and destroyed by st state. For example, we, we, had a, uh, we had a river, we had a mountain, we had a forest, but now actually we don't have because they uh, bombarding, they, they just, uh, um, um, yeah, destroyed all the nature, but uh, we, we, we know that nature is not just like the, we, we, we can see. There is a, a big nature we cannot see and the, uh, the, uh, they giving us life, I mean, in, in Kurdistan. And we just talking about, the, for example, is the Kurdish movement saying that we, 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 we are uh, um, ecological movement, yeah? And it's, it's, it's very difficult to explain how we can uh, make a relation with the nature like an ecological moment. I mean, if, for example, I, I'm, um, I'm working about, uh, yeah, I'm working about uh, economy and I think I, I can share with, uh, with it. We, we're talking in, about the collective needs if we need to organize the communal life and communal economy, we, we need to consider it the collective needs, not the individual needs, because there is a not individual needs. We, we, our all the needs, it's really it's collective. And this, if we, we putting the center of the life, the collective needs, and we can, we can change the, our relation with the nature, we be saying that if we don't have a, a we don't have a democratic relation with the nature, uh, we cannot uh, take a, uh, have a democratic relation between us, I mean the, between the people and people, person and person. Is, but I, I think it's very big discussion about how we, can, uh, how we can change our relation with the nature. We tried, yeah. As, uh, I mean, it's about the cooperative, collective needs, and also all the working we are doing. But yeah, there is a very big uh, issue. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Asise. Ines. Okay, so well, I'll go first with the feminist uh, question because I think it's, it's an important one. Um, well, I think that the first thing to say is in the Zapatista movement, they say that the first struggle was an internal one. Women needed to gain their space, and that was the first struggle even before uh, the uprising in 1994. So after that, of course, they, they are still struggling, and that connects with the question about how there are anti-democratic or um, these kind of hierarchical practices within uh, movements, right? So they are still struggling about that, but they are trying to do a lot of things, like. For instance, um, they had like these women's encounters in, in the Zapatista region. Uh, they also, like for the CNI, they did like a, a talk about this Consejo Indígena de Gobierno, and they say like the, it should be a spokeswoman, not a man, a woman. So an indigenous woman needed to represent that. And every community needed to have at least one man and one woman to, to make this Consejo. So, it was not something about numbers, but it was something about uh, changing the perspective and the kind of relationships within the communities. Because of course, there are many of these communities that of course they still reproduce patriarchal ways. But, uh, and the last example I want to give is the, is the one that uh, uh, when the Zapatistas came here, uh, the first person and to, to to place a foot in Europe and, well, in Spain, and, and said some words, was what they call Otroa. So, men, woman, uh, Otroa. I don't know how to say it in, in English. But this idea of changing this perspective, I think, is, is quite important, and they're trying to, to break uh, uh, the patriarchal way, but they, of course, there's still room for improvement. 
So th this was the first one. And, and the other one about the state, well, I, I disagree about that, that stance that of class domination. I see more like a way to organize uh, capitalist social relations. So the problem for me is that uh, when we think about the state, we think uh, of having like to struggling in, in just betting to, to reach things and rights and whatever through the state is that we are losing focus of doing things more bigger than that. And, and we are not really breaking capitalist social relations. And of course, there is the, an important thing here that we need, of course, to survive daily life. We need rights, we need, uh, uh, and these movements, of course, um, have their own contradictions. I, I'm not speaking really with the Zapatistas because that's more complex, but in the Senai there are a lot of communities with these contradictions because they need to negotiate, they need to find ways within the state to, to, to survive, that's the thing. So, of course, they are trying to do that, but they, it's not like the main focus on their agenda. The thing is that we forget when you are betting with, to, to, th to do things within the state, we are forgetting to do things against the state. So for me, it's, it's, I really like the perspective of John Holloway within this, of talking about in and against the state at the same time. And of course, um, there are really important uh, struggles uh, being uh, also within the state. And the last one uh, about nature. Well, I talk a little bit about this, and, and I need to, to say first that I don't want uh, to give an answer because I don't want to essentialize and say like all these indigenous groups because at, in the Senate are 43 indigenous groups and a lot of communities. So to think about that they have only one kind of relationship with nature is, is crazy. Uh, it is really complex and I think uh, the idea of uh, the struggle uh, for life is is bringing the, uh, together these different perspectives and they are trying to articulate something about this. But um, but, I, but they don't generalize it, and they, they, in their own way, they are doing uh, um, in their communities their, their own ways uh, to relate with nature and defend it. But the, the main thing is that uh, they understand it uh, like they are part of it. Like I said, like they, they don't see territory as pieces of land. They, they are part of this, it's, it's daily life, and nature is part of, like, of themselves. So of course there are um, contradictions within these movements and, and, and of course we, we could speak a lot of that too. So, thank you, Ines. So uh, we don't have so much time, but I think if there is some, <laughs> wait, 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 if there is some question or some subject that it wasn't, um, or we, we, we haven't spoke about that, let's make a question. Please, the question super concrete. And there is like one here. Another one there, and Gustavo from the organizer, uh, and Flora. So um, that's one. Okay, hello. Uh, thank you, uh, Aziza. I'm being aware of how difficult it is to tackle patriarchy in Kurdistan. I wonder, and also Ines, I want, want to also ask you, how is it, uh, how is the representat representation of like, um, in, sorry, <laughs> um, in European context, you say uh, finta, like um, female, intersex, trans, non-binary. How is the representat representation of those kind of um, bodies and um, uh, identities? I know it's a difficult answer to question, but since 90s, we are talking about the freedom of women, but we don't go on that man movement end. So I wonder, is there any like tension to change this or is there any hope to like go towards it? Thank you for, um, oh, okay. <laughs> so thank you for everything and very interesting. And I was late and now I am very resentful of this. <laughs> But um, my question is more like an ethical kind of a little bit thing, which, um, well, you said bon vivre, then you said feminism, but not um, 
can, they don't uh, self-identify feminism. We talked about uh, democracy, liberal, non-liberal, whatever it means. And I was wondering, I work with epistemology and deconstructing epistemology, and, and there is like a thing to it for me. Is this something that contributes to the, or let's say, transnational agenda? or like the whole entire of movements, of many, many, many movements, is share some sort of a deconstructive, not anti-fascist, anti-neoliberal, and we could go on uh, about it, um, if we deconstruct the epistemology and start using specific terms or terminology outside that is devel not developed in areas of the global north, but outside of it. Um, yeah, and what would you think about this as a... Yeah, political act. Yes, thanks uh, for the presentation. Uh, my question is in the same way that uh, my friend, uh, it's from Ines, uh, how can you see uh, now at this moment in the Zapatist movement, movement the, uh, the criticize of the binary or heteronormative uh, way and, and how can involve other identities, for example, lesbian, gays, uh, trans people, because we are in Mexico in a special moment because they're, they're a way anti-trans and, and very uh, risky for, for the trans people and, and I, I like to, to hear your, your think about this. Thank you very much. So it was uh, very inspiring. So my, my question is, uh, so I will do it briefly, so related to what um, Eileen said, Hongao. And I think that, you know, so we are here because we are discussing the authoritarian terms and, you know, like the new fest movement. And do you think that the, your, your, so the movement you are considering, like Zapatism, uh, Chile, or Java, should or can have the same strategy toward, like, a, let's say, democratic neoliberal forces or, like, a progressive forces of Boric or for example, with fascist and authoritarian movement, I think, for example, in Chile. So we can have, or you can have, or should have the same strategy against caste or against body. I mean, so that is in, in, in order, or against AMLO or against, I don't know, Salinas de Gotari, for example. That, that's my question about the strategy against fascists. Should be different or can be the same as in other kind of like, political forces? Thank you. You can keep the microphone. So, who wants to start? Katia? Okay. So, um, I just wanted to, to reply to very quickly to the other question from the first round. Dario, I don't know how to reply to, no, no, that's a question or comment. So, I think maybe we'll continue talking in like, because otherwise, it's, I don't have answers either about that. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, but definitely it's interesting how like these more kind of mainstream forces within political science and sociology, they kind of remain dividing the political from the social and that's something, okay, okay so this is, has the label to be political because it's tied to kind of the more representative politics. Um, and about in kind of more in concrete, uh, in terms of how, um, how we face these contradictions, I think I'm very um, in line with what Ines said about like the movements themselves are full of contradictions and I think it's very important not to romanticize and I'm talking from the place of be being an activist myself and not looking at it from this detached point of view because I'm not, this is not the work I do. And, and then we, have, we are attempting all the time to do things a little bit differently. Um, and that's what I've seen in my engagement with m different movements in the case of Chile. And, and I think uh, this, this uh, fighting of anti-democratic, what you call anti-democratic practices can be expressed in the, the idea of affective politics. I was talking about this idea of uh, we, we care for each other with not only kind of these comrades, you know, um, we, the, the idea of popular education, it's also kind of aiming at uh, breaking down hierarchies and potential, like if some people are speaking more than others and like very clear rules for consensus decision making and for enacting horizontality. So how, how do we organize so we can prevent from anti-democratic practices to, to, to arise? 
uh, to keep them in line at the end, because I think we are, we are all the time bringing uh, these things into practice as well. And like how we see this relationship of nature uh, with as alternative democracies in practice. In the, my case, I'm kind of where I'm based in Chile, I've seen that there are two kind of um, dimensions on, of strategies. One, which is that several diverse movements join the anti-extractivist struggles. And I think that's something that you see a lot in Chile right now. Uh, that's because extractivism is so uh, um, going like to destroy everything, not by bombs, but by mining projects, and by forestry, and by uh, different kind of corporate, huge corporate and industrial projects. So different networks and movements, assemblies, they, go to, they get together to fight extractivism. And secondly, uh, these movements, they, 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 they don't only stay in the resistance, they seek to prefigure, they seek to create uh, practices of when vivid, I will say, like so alternative economies, so I was talking the food co-ops, the community gardens, so how we kind of reconnect differently with nature and we care for what is left of nature. Um, and I think about the, the the kind of the contribution to the struggles in terms of the concepts, I think it's very, so I, I definitely agree with you. So that's what I was, when I was preparing my presentation, I didn't really engage with the concept of democracy because it's not a, something that we discuss within the movements. And I think uh, it's, it's, and I think that's the, those are the, the, the concept that we should bring into this discussion. So we discuss in the movements, I'm involved about autonomy, about horizontality, about assembly-based politics, about autogestion, self-management. So those are the concepts we bring to the discussion. We don't talk about um, reform or revolution, we talk about emancipation, so that's what the concepts I bring into the discussion as well. Um, and. And I think it's also about how we create this knowledge. So how we, I mean, the kind of acknowledging this awkward and uncomfortable place of being an academic, you know, and at the same time being an activist and how we acknowledge our privileged position. And at the same time, we, we try to be as respectful as possible and to bring this discussion uh, from the dialogues that we are being kind of weaving with our Amigos, compañeros, hmm? so that, that's what I, I will add to that. Um, and, and I think definitely, I remember this Zapatista woman, I spent also some time in Oventic uh, about the question about the same strategies, and I asked her that, and she said, how you're gonna apply the same strategies if you are telling me that you live in this flat in, your, in a 15th floor and we are here in the countryside? So she, I felt very, bad about asking that question to her because she was very clear that the, that the strategies need to be different according to the territories where we are based and that, but what's important and I think that's the international, international strategies that Ines was talking and Asisi as well, it's so important that we learn from each other, that we learn from the, now we're different experiences that we engage in conversations and it's, it's so nice because then we bring these things and we share it with our movements and there are things that actually can be a bit of a taking borrowed mm? but um, but yeah so that exchange of solidarity of knowledges strategies ideas but I, I from at least from my perspective I don't think there is one way to do things uh, yeah yeah if you want, what's the question? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, about the representation of our uh, other identity in our struggle, when we talk about uh, um, women liberation, we're talking about uh, uh, liberation of society. And we, we don't thinking about like a biological identity, like we are women because we are take a body of women or the, we have a men or they have a different body. Or the, we we talking about the how we participate in the society um, with our body, but also our mentality. I mean, for example, um, when we talk about uh, how we organize the um, autonomous uh, organization of women, 
because we, we create a space that where all the people can participate, not just women. And in this way, for example, uh, all the space of organization of women participate in another identity. But, for example, when I ask this question in, in, in Roshawa, I say, how to participate in another identity in the assembly, for example, and say, if, if a group uh, defined them other identity or other groups or other sector of society, they need to be organized and then they can take a place in assembly and they be, can be make a part of the decision. And I say, but if people is the one person, how can they participate in the assembly with, without a group? And uh, I surprised uh, with the answer because a person uh, told me um, all the one person can be organized. It's not the necessity to a group or huge group or huge people, but one person if want to uh, fight with our with their um, uh, right and they can participate in assembly like a group. They have a, a voice in assembly. And, and this way, I, 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 I can say in the organization of women, the participate people with identity, multitude of the identity is like a, not just a, a sexual identity, is the um, different way of uh, thinking and different of way of, for example, believing. I mean, is that there is a Muslim woman and there is a Christian woman, or there is a, there is a, a we, we're talking about the person. I mean, is the, for our struggle for liberation of women is, is for liberation of society. For, for, uh, for this, we're we working with the, the men now. Yeah. We, 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 we see our, we are responsible to change the society and change the men because we need to change the patriarchy and to dominate the all, all of them. Um, and the strategy, strategy against fascism, I, I think Zapatista saying very good thing was organizate. <laughs> yeah, we need to organize and in the, all the part of the life. I mean, is that there is a, a big fascist Erdogan in, in our region and not just in Turkey, uh, it's in Syria and, and other all the part of the Kurdistan. And we try, we try to organize in society and uh, organize the society, no? Uh, and this way we can uh, build a strategy, I think. There is a not, we cannot uh, uh, create a big strategy plan to <laughs> destroy all the, the fascism of the Erdogan but we can uh, destroy it in, in our life, in our communities. And I think in the Kurdistan, we, we're making in this way. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Ines. Okay, so uh, um, I'll try to be quick on this one. Um, well, the, the first one uh, about uh, the Zapatista, about including diversity of identities and and breaking this binary uh, vision. I think that one of the most things like, that have impacted me, and, and I think like for uh, the Mexican left, is the, is the way Zapatistas began to have this inclusive language. And they have been really careful and constant in keeping it in their communities. So for this, like the first thing is that, like the way they, they are trying to express themselves about this. But also, I was talking about Marie Jose that came here and, and was the first one, uh, Otroa, to, to put like a foot here. But also, he, he was also part of the army, of the SZLN, because well, in the Zapatistas you have part that is the communities and you have the army. And to have like, uh, an Otroa in the army like says a lot of things about that. Um, but of course, um, there are like, if we think about again, like indigenous communities in, in, in Mexico, there are like a diversity, but the thing is that all of them are trying to, to, to think about, uh, about this. And, 
because you could have, like in, in Oaxaca, in a region of uh, Mexico, that the mushes are really like, like a praise, like the mushes are like uh, the same, like Otroa. So, so it's, and you have in other parts that, of course, they're, they're are homophobic, but communities are exchanging these kind of situations and are trying to, to think differently and, and, and building um, a different kinds of relationship within the communities. Actually, in the, when the Consejo Indígena de Gobierno was forming, one of the streams were, was what they call sexual dissidences. So trying to think about that and how to relate um, uh, in these terms. Uh, the question about terminology, uh, I, I was talking a lot of, of, uh, of the way we, we need to keep our grammar creative, but of course um, there's a risk and, and I think that uh, Katia was, uh, was talking about that on when he said about Buen Vivir, uh, because sometimes we want to bring these concepts, these ideas we hear in the communities, but the risk that they will be absorbed by the, by the same logic of power we aim to break is, is there. So we need to be really careful. Um, it's not only a way of, uh, of using their language, but trying to break uh, the, gram the grammar, the way we think about that. Um, I don't know. But it's, it's a difficult task, I think, that, yeah, and our privileged position always is, is a, it's a problem. And finally, the, the question of, uh, of Gustavo. Uh, yeah, I, well, I agree with what they have uh, already said, like Katia and Assise. But, of course, we need to, I just want to, to add that, of course, strategies need to be according to times and geographies. But not only that, I think that, what Zapatistas have told, told us was that, but we need to have the same stance, and the same stance is to be anti-capitalist. So that is, doesn't have to change. The rest, the way we, we fight against that, yeah, it can change. Well, that would be all. Thank you. Thank you, Ines. So thank you all. Thank you, the panelists, Katia, Asise, Ines. It was a pleasure for me, and thank you all.